introduction. Um, I want to thank also uh, Constance Anonis and everybody else from Dear Animal for organizing this event. I know it's not easy to get uh, a good crowd of people to come along and listen to lectures on philosophy or ethics uh, or specifically about animals. So uh, I'm really happy to see this very large room uh, holding a, a lot of people in it. And that's obviously a good sign for the future of the political party, the animal, that uh, you have many people who have come to this event. And uh, I am particularly happy to be here because I think it's an important initiative to try to influence politics for animals and also more generally for altruism and compassion. And uh, although there are different ways of doing that, as I'll say a little bit about shortly, I think founding a political party for animals is, uh, has been uh, successful, uh, as Anya Hasenkamp said, in, in many different countries. Um, it has had a certain amount of success. Uh, I think a lot depends on the voting system. Uh, for example, I would not advocate it in the United States where effectively you have no proportional representation. You simply have uh, first past the post. In fact, you have in many cases just the one who gets the largest number of votes wins, even if that's not even 50%. Um, and to have a minority party drawing votes from the party that, let's say, has the most hope of doing something positive for animals, even if that's often not very much, uh, but to take votes away from them under a, that voting system is just likely to mean that the worst option gets elected, uh, and that's not a good thing. But, you know, countries that have proportional representation, uh, you don't run that danger, you can direct your preferences where you think best, and so I think it's, it's definitely an initiative that should be supported. Okay. So I'm going to begin uh, talking a little bit about ethics and philosophy, about why it's important to give animals a voice, uh, as this political party is trying to do. And then I will talk a little bit about, I'm not sure whether I'm doing that, or someone else is doing that. Oh, maybe not. Maybe there's a loose connection there, not sure. I'll try not to wave my hands around too much. Uh, yeah, then I'll talk a little bit about political initiatives and uh, uh, what may happen there. So, why should we give animals a voice? For me, this is the basic reason. Uh, Jeremy Bentham, that's not me at all. <laughs> I don't um, Jeremy Bentham, was the founder of the English utilitarian tradition and was the first to clearly state that animals are, have to be included in ethics. And uh, this was at a time when he wrote these words, uh, at a time when there was no legislation anywhere in the world to protect animals against cruelty. But Bentham recognized, you might, you might recognize the year in which this was written. It's the year of the French Revolution, of course, of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen by the French Revolutionaries. And Bentham actually raised the question, why should ideas about rights, why should ideas about laws protecting sentient beings stop with human beings? Why should they not extend to all beings capable of suffering? So he pointed out that the French revolutionaries had recognized that the color of a person's skin is not a reason to make them slaves. The French revolutionaries abolished slavery in the French colonies. Unfortunately, later on it was restored to some extent, but, but at the time Bentham was writing, they abolished it. And Bentham says, well, if the color of a person's skin is not a reason 
to um, to make them slaves or to uh, allow other people to torment them or inflict suffering on them. Why should the fact that they have fur or the fact that they have a tail, why should that be a reason for allowing other people to torment them or to inflict pain on them? So I think this was a, a really advanced and enlightened statement and extremely difficult to find anything comparable to that during at least the 1800 years of Western Christian civilization. Maybe if you go back before that, you can find some thoughts um, in, in Buddha perhaps, or you know, maybe in Plutarch, the uh, ancient Roman. Uh, but um, for a long period, there was nothing like this. Uh, and yet this seems to me to be absolutely correct. Uh, whereas Kant, for example, I guess the, the reference to reason may be a reference to someone like uh, Immanuel Kant, uh, who had suggested that only <coughs> self-aware beings, only autonomous beings, could uh, be a subject of concern, that uh, <coughs> because animals were not self-conscious, they were not ends in themselves, but they were only a means to the ends of humans. Um, but Bentham says, no, you know, it's not reason, it's also not the use of language. Uh, possibly he's thinking about Descartes there. Uh, um, but it's the capacity to suffer. That's what really matters. If there is pain, that's a bad thing. Uh, if there is uh, uh, absence of pain, that's better. So, I think this is right, and uh, despite all the kind words said about animal liberation uh, here, in a sense, uh, I'm really supporting and elaborating what Jeremy Bentham said. So here's uh, a quotation from the first chapter of Animal Liberation, which is maybe a little bit more explicit than what Bentham said, but is really very much in line with that. Uh, so, you see, my view is, <coughs> if a being suffers, there can be no moral justification for refusing to take that suffering into consideration. Uh, no matter what the nature of the being, the principle of equality requires that its suffering be counted equally with the like suffering, insofar as our comparisons can be made, of any other being. Let me just say a few words about, uh, some, of the, uh, about some of the points in this. So, um, firstly, I'm talking here about the principle of equality, and I'm drawing on that principle because I'm assuming that we all accept some principle of equality. We all accept it among humans, for example, that you know, we say all humans are equal. But we often don't stop and think about what we mean when we say all humans are equal. We certainly don't mean that all humans are the same. You want to give me this? Okay. Okay. So this is this is working. Good. Very good. Okay, we'll stick with this one. Great. Um, okay, so as I was saying, uh, we all accept that there is a principle of equality for humans. That doesn't mean that humans are the same in every respect. Anybody who looks around the world and people they know and people they see know that humans differ in a whole lot of ways. Uh, we were talking about uh, uh, well, the, the Dear Animal was talking about encouraging altruism and compassion, for example. Well, humans are not equal in their degree of altruism or their compassion for others. They're not equal in their physical strength. They're not equal in their ability to run. And they're not equal in a lot of other capacities too. They're not equal even in the uh, aspects that, that Kant thought were important like their ability to reason. Some, some people reason better than others, and some humans, uh, through intellectual disabilities of various kinds, may not really be able to reason at all. But we don't take humans who are less able to reason than most of us and say, well, they're just means to our ends, and therefore if we want to perform painful experiments on them, we can do so or we can use them in other ways. 
uh, enslave them or something like that. Because we say, well, no, uh, all humans are equal in some sense. Some people would say all humans have rights. Um, and that's why we shouldn't do that. So I'm drawing on that principle, and like Bentham, I'm saying, why does that principle stop at the boundaries of our own species? If there is this principle of equality, and we reject the idea, let's take a really crude example, we reject the idea who says, only members of my race are equal, whatever race that might be. They're superior to any other races. And of course, we've known philosophies who take that principle, and, and governments, regimes, that take that principle. But if we want to say, no, that's wrong, you can't just say that your group is the only group that's equal. You have to acknowledge relevant similarities with others. Then it's really no better to say that all humans are equal, but no non-human animals are. So that's one point. The other point I want to mention is the like suffering counted equally with the like suffering insofar as rough comparisons can be made of any other being. So if we're talking about equality, it doesn't mean that we treat all beings the same, but it means we look at what interests they have, we look at how much they're suffering, and we don't discount that suffering because they're not members of our species. So that view is also stated here. So what we're talking about really, I'm suggesting the best basis for equality is the principle of equal consideration of interests, and that means equal weight to be given to similar interests. Uh, and we can apply that both within our own species and between different species. Um, so, as I say here, it's similar interests that we're talking about. We're not saying that interests are the same, just as different humans have different interests. Uh, for some humans, maybe it might be a great deprivation if they can never hear uh, music, uh, whereas other humans might be indifferent to music. Some humans might think that it's tremendously important to have access to nature and the green outdoors. Other people might not care if they spend all their time uh, in a busy city. So people have different interests and when we should give equal weight to similar interests. And the same is true comparing humans and animals. They have different interests, but where we're talking about interests of similar importance to them, then we should count them equally. And so this is uh, what I want to reject, the idea of what I call speciesism. It's not actually a term I invented. It was coined by Richard Ryder, who was a, uh, or still is, I guess, a, an English uh, psychologist um, who I met when I was in Oxford as a graduate student in the early 1970s. And he was particularly concerned about experiments on animals. And the first time I came across this word uh, was he had, a, had some leaflets printed with a picture of a very sad looking chimpanzee uh, that was covered in spots. And this was a chimpanzee who had been infected with syphilis uh, in order to try to do research which supposedly was going to help humans. Um, and the leaflet had the word speciesism across the top. And it immediately struck me that that is a really powerful idea that makes the parallel with racism and sexism that just as they are wrong, it's also wrong to think that the fact that a being is not a member of our species means that it just doesn't count. Or even means that it interests count less than our own interests. Okay, now I talked about similar interests. And one question that comes up, and I'm sure will come up as the animal becomes more influential and has to take positions on various issues relating to animals, is um, should, should we oppose the killing of animals in all circumstances? or in many circumstances, and how should we compare that to the killing of human beings? So, 
What I'm suggesting is that it's possible that different cognitive abilities, different capacities to reason and to understand one's situation, do make a difference to the interest one has in continuing to live. And that therefore, the principles that I've been talking about, the rejection of speciesism, the principle of equal consideration of similar interest, does not mean that we should regard every killing of an animal as murder and as serious as we regard with regard the killing of a normal human being with the kind of capacities that I'm talking about here, right? With, for example, plans for the future. So one of the reasons why we think it tragic normally if a human being is killed is that person is unable to realize her or his plans for the future. And I'm sure we, we all have here, everybody in this room has plans for the future. If you're capable of listening to what I'm saying, understanding it, you certainly have thought about your own future, you've thought about what you want to do, maybe you've thought in the short term about what you want to do for the rest of the summer, are you going to take a vacation somewhere, where, with whom. Maybe you've thought about what you want to do in years to come. If you're a student, you might have thought about what career you're going to pursue. Or if you're already in a career, you might have thought about where you will go with that, how far that will take you. Or later on in your career, you might have thought what you will do in your retirement. We all plan for the future. And part of the tragedy of being killed prematurely is you don't get to realize those hopes and plans. Of course, that's not the only aspect lose your future life and whatever joys or happiness you would have had. Uh, you are surely also part of a network of people who care about you and love you and they will grieve at your loss. So all those things are relevant and they may not be as relevant for some non-human animals. It will depend on what species we're talking about, it will depend on their capacities, but typically, generally, they won't be as relevant. So that's why I ask this question, um, and I don't think the answer is really obvious. I think uh, political movements for animals can differ on how much weight they want to give to trying to stop the killing of animals, where it's not causing suffering, where it is done humanely, often of course it's not, um, with questions about reducing animal suffering, which I'll talk about more shortly. And a rather diff different and somewhat more philosophical question is raised uh, here by the second part. Um, because I'm often asked when I talk about animals and ethics, and particularly when I talk about being vegetarian or vegan, I'm often asked about, uh, well, what about animals who really have good lives? Somebody will say, I know a, a farmer, he's an organic farmer, uh, his animals are outdoors, they're with their other members of their species, they live a life that's suitable for the interests of their species, and then one day uh, they are ready to be killed, and, and they are killed. And let's assume, again it doesn't always happen, let's assume they are killed painlessly and without fear or suffering on the way. Is that a bad thing? Because, this person will point out, if the farmer was not able to kill the animals and sell their flesh, uh, or let's say it's an egg producer who was not able to kill the hens once they stopped laying eggs, but had to keep them and feed them after they stopped laying eggs, um, then they wouldn't have existed at all. So if those animals had a good life, can you really say it's a bad thing to kill them if otherwise they would not even have existed? Well, that's a more difficult question, um, and it's one on which philosophers who I admire and respect have different views. So again, I think it's something that in a political party, in a political movement, you probably should leave open, you should probably allow people to have different views on that question, and try to find common ground between uh, people who do, and that common ground, I think, should be the prevention of the major forms of suffering. Okay, and that's what I want to talk about now. And I want to talk about some of the successes 
that have occurred in doing that. Because I think in the animal movement, it's often the case that people become discouraged because they don't see progress being made. We talk, as you've been talking, about the need to change our attitudes to animals, to change the systems of exploitation that we have against, uh, that, that we use to exploit animals. But sometimes then people feel, well, this is such a big struggle, this is such a huge conceptual revolution that it's, it's hopeless, we can't get anywhere. But I think that's a mistake, and I think particularly in Europe, you should be aware of the fact that there has been important progress made over the last 20 or 30 years. When I say important progress, I don't mean that we have achieved any of our goals. I don't mean even that we are halfway to any of our goals. But given the size and the nature of the problem, if we've taken some steps, even small steps towards our goals, we've made a difference. We've made the world a less bad place than it was beforehand. So let me just mention briefly some of these things which will be known to many of you, I'm sure. So when I wrote Animal Liberation, one of the worst forms of animal husbandry that I was aware of was the rearing of veal calves in individual stalls. And in fact, this was actually developed in this part of the world. It was known in England as the Dutch veal system. Uh, so the idea was, if you take a calf and you want to produce veal, veal was typically the meat from an animal who had not started eating grass. Meat, meat, meat from a calf who had not started eating grass. Because once they started eating grass, they got iron from the grass and their flesh turned a more red colour. And that was not veal. Veal was supposed to be a pale pink colour, whitish pink colour. But of course, if you take, if you leave the calf with the mother on grass, the calf will start eating grass quite soon, in a week or two. And so you won't get much veal. It'll be a baby animal that the veal will come from. But the, these veal producers had the idea, we'll take the calf away from the mother, we'll lock the calf up in an individual stall so that uh, he or she can't walk around really and develop any muscle tissue. We don't want that, we want soft veal. Um, and we'll make sure that they don't get any grass or hay or straw or any other roughage. We'll just feed them on uh, a kind of milk replacement. Uh, and these hoops that you see here are for putting the bucket of milk in. Uh, and so the calves in that way could be much bigger. You could keep them about three to four months and you got more veal, so it's profitable. But it was a miserable system for veal calves because they were isolated, they're social animals, they were isolated, they were not able to exercise, uh, and of course they got no roughage. So that's one of the things that the animal movement uh, campaigned on. Uh, it was banned in the United Kingdom already in 1990 to keep calves in individual stalls. Uh, the European Union ban came into effect in 2007. And finally, rather behind the Europeans typically, uh, California at least banned it in the United States. Um, uh, it's still actually legal in many parts of the United States, although the veal industry is moving away from it. So I'm not saying that the production of veal is good or desirable uh, at all, but I am saying that allowing the calves to live in a group and to move around is a small improvement over how they were reared before. Uh, with pigs, again, the breeding sows, so what you're looking at here are the mothers of the pigs who were sent to market. These animals are, were, are, well, still are really, essentially treated as breeding machines. Their role in the system is to be pregnant, to give birth to the piglets, briefly to suckle them, to allow them to feed from her, and then they're taken away so that she will become pregnant again. Uh, but again, you know, uh, they had been uh, kept 
individually like this in these very narrow stalls. Um, you can see how small the stalls are. Sows are, are large animals. Each sow doesn't even have room to lie on her side and keep her legs in her own stall. The legs, you see there, stick out into the stall of the next one. Uh, and, and that's all they had to do all day. All the time they were pregnant, they never got out of those stalls for, for months at a time. Um, and all they had to do all day was stand up or lie down. Uh, and uh, essentially it was a really miserable existence. And there was plenty of evidence of that from animal behavior experts. So uh, that too was a target. Uh, a few years later, um, banned in the UK in 99, uh, banned in the European Union by 2013, uh, the same California law, 2015, uh, also outlawed individual sow stalls. And then there's the standard battery cage for hens, which you're seeing here. Um, small wire cages, hens very crowded, maybe five hens in a small cage, um, rubbed against, whoops, sorry, rubbed against the wire, uh, as you see here, uh, so she's lost a lot of feathers, even the wing feathers as well. Uh, subject to a lot of aggression from other hens in the crowded cage she can't get away from. Not able to lay her eggs in a sheltered sort of private space. Uh, and it's agreed by ethologists that it's an important instinct for a hen to lay her egg in a nest somewhere not out in the open, not necessarily where uh, all the other hens are. So she was not able to do that. Uh, and this too uh, finally got, got banned in the European Union, uh, first in Switzerland, Sweden, uh, European Union banned. It did not eliminate cages altogether, um, but it did have larger cages with more room and with nesting boxes. Um, and California also a couple of years later. So these are all significant improvements that affect hundreds of millions of animals. When you're talking about an entity as big as the European Union, you're talking about hundreds of millions of hens right now living in these modified cages or else not in cages at all, but free to move around the floor of a large barn. Still very crowded, still not often anyway, not able to go outside, but not as miserable an existence as it was. So um, these things make a difference. These things were worth fighting for. They were worth the effort of the animal organizations that have fought for them. And these are things, as I say, that have been done without a political party for animals in existence, basically, when these decisions were made. Um, there weren't political parties for the, for the animals. Um, because even, say, in 2012, uh, that was when the ban came into effect, but there was a 10-year phase-in, so we're going back before the existence even of the Dutch party for the animals. Um, but they show that you can do things in that way, and now I think we have to take a further step and try to get politicians elected who can really make build on that and make further changes. Okay, so... Let's talk a little bit about getting political. Um, and I was just in, in Paris um, uh, promoting a book that I've written, uh, which in French has the, uh, the cute title, and pardon my terrible French accent, uh, Théorie du tube de dentifrice, The Theory of the Tube of Toothpaste. Uh, and it's a book about tactics that I wrote 20 years ago in English, um, which was really a tribute to uh, a friend of mine, and uh, I think the most successful campaigner for animals in the United States, a man called Henry Spira. And I want to mention Henry, it's appropriate to mention Henry here, because he was actually born in Belgium. Um, uh, he was born in Belgium, but uh, he was Jewish, so once the Nazi threat became real, uh, his father uh, took the family to Panama, where they spent the war, and then after the war he was able to go to the United States. Um, but uh, if you want to know why the book is called uh, Theory of Human Toothpaste, it's because Henry's theory was that getting change for animals is like getting toothpaste out of a blocked tube. There are two things you have to consider. One, how bad is this blockage? Is the blockage potentially one you could get around? 
And secondly, how much pressure can you put on the bottom of the tube? So Henry campaigned particularly against corporations. Um, he, I think, is the person most responsible for the fact that big cosmetics companies today do not test their products by putting them into the eyes of fully conscious, unanesthetized rabbits, which was what all of the big cosmetics companies, Revlon, Avon, Bristol Myers, L'Oreal, they were all doing when Henry started his campaign. And so he thought, how can I change this? How can we get them to change it? And of course, instinctively you would say, well, have a campaign against these companies and say they must stop testing their products on conscious animals or on animals at all. But, at least in the United States, if, let's say, Revlon, because that was the company he picked first as the sort of flagship, at least, of the American cosmetics industry, if Revlon had stopped testing its products on animals, it would not have been able to introduce any new products at all. Because the government regulations said before you can introduce a new product, you must test it on animals to ensure its safety. So that would have been the equivalent of an impassable blockage in the toothpaste tube. There is no way that Revlon would have said, well, we won't introduce any new products to the market. That would be commercial suicide, and they were not going to do that. So instead, Henry thought, how can we have a small blockage, one that is easier to remove? And his answer to that was, I will ask Revlon to put aside a small percentage of its revenues to support research that develops an alternative test not using animals. So that's what he asked Revlon to do. A tiny percentage of their revenues, big company, to go to research to use tissue culture or cell culture in vitro to assure the safety of its products. And that happened, it took a few years, but eventually it was developed. The American Food and Drug Administration was persuaded that it was a successful way of uh, testing the safety of products, and so the companies could stop doing it. But he also had to put pressure on Revlon. Even though it was easier, he had to campaign against Revlon, he had to publicize what they were doing to rabbits. Effectively, he had to pose a threat to their corporate image. And their image, of course, was one of beauty. They showed glamorous models using their cosmetics, and Henry juxtaposed with that the rabbits who were essentially having their eyes blistered as part of the testing that they were doing. And Revlon realized, after a little while, that this was not good for business. So it would be better to sacrifice a small amount of their revenue and develop an alternative and get Henry off their back and his campaign to stop than to continue to do what they were doing uh, for indefinitely. So, we have to think in terms of politics how we can succeed. But, as I say, this was a bit of a digression. I was in Paris and um, I saw that the uh, Parti, Parti Animaliste uh, uh, saw a poster of it um, that uh, was uh, online. Um, and it's interesting because what animal is it showing here? Well, it's showing a very cute kitten. I guess it's, it's, a, it's a kitten. Um, and somebody looking at it. So, there's a dilemma here, I think. The dilemma is, to what extent are we really going to be ideologically pure and say we want to reduce the suffering of animals irrespective of their species? And to what extent are we going to appeal, try to appeal to the voters because you're likely to get more votes by having a picture of a cat than you are if you have a picture of a chicken, let's say. So that's the problem, because in terms of the amount of suffering, cats don't really make a, you know, a large, up a large proportion of animal suffering, right? So we ask this question, where should a party for the animals focus? And I, look, I did a little bit of research to say, well, how many small cats are there in the world? I, I, the figures are not domestic cats, because some of these cats are feral, um, living freely, but, but in turn, you know, we're talking about small cats, we're not talking about lions and tigers here. Um, so the total number according to the Ecology Global Network, um, and I'm not vouching for the accuracy of this, but they say it's around 600 
million. That's a large number, of course. But how many vertebrate land animals are killed annually in food production worldwide? The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization says 65 billion. So each year, food production uses more than 100 times the total number of all the small cats in the world. And of course, it's not the case that all the small cats in the world have miserable lives. Many people who own cats look after them quite well. Um, some of the others, as I said, are feral, and maybe their lives are not too bad either. Um, so, in terms of the amount of suffering, it's a small, very small amount compared to the food industry. So which animals suffer the most, if you're going to talk about it? I think we have to come back to chickens here. Um, and here I'm not talking about uh, egg-laying hens, I'm talking about chickens raised for meat. And that's because the number is so huge. And also because there hasn't really been that much change in the condition of keeping chickens. There are some European U Union regulations that may help a little bit, but uh, you're able to have them incredibly crowded. And a further point about it is that not only are they crowded, but they are suffering for a significant part of their life. Now let me explain a little bit more about this. Why does Professor John Webster, who's a really important uh, animal welfare expert and professor of animal husbandry at the University of Bristol and the founder of one of the largest centers for scientific centers for animal welfare in Europe, perhaps in the world. Um, why does he say this is the single most severe systematic example of man's inhumanity to another sentient animal? Well, the reason is that these chickens have been selectively bred to put on weight very fast. So the typical chicken sold in a supermarket has, is only six to seven weeks old. It's basically a baby, but it's as big as fully grown mature chickens used to be. It's economically, it makes sense to try to have your chicken growing as fast as possible. You get to sell more quickly. But there is a welfare problem, and that is that you have these heavy birds with immature legs. Their leg bones have not developed sufficiently to support their weight. So what John Webster is saying is that for the last at least two weeks of those seven, six or seven weeks that they live, they are actually in pain just standing up. They, he, he likens it to the kind of pain that somebody with severe arthritis would experience if they had to stand up. Perhaps some of you will know people with severe arthritis. So that's why he says uh, it's such a systematic inhumanity. And of course the numbers are huge. Of that 65 million animals I talked about before, a large fraction of them are chickens raised for meat. In the United States alone, it's about 9 billion chickens raised each year for meat. I don't know, I don't have the figure for the uh, European Union. Uh, and moreover, you know, so, as I say, the leg bones can be immature, and sometimes, in some cases, even, the bird will, the legs will collapse. So that's what's happened in this case. This is not the way a chicken normally sits down, if any of you have had, kept chickens. They don't sit down normally with their legs splayed out like that. This bird's legs have collapsed under, uh, under his or her weight. Can't support them anymore. Now, what is going to happen to this bird? Uh, this bird is in a shed that maybe holds 20,000 chickens. This bird will not get any individual attention from anyone. Somebody will walk through the shed maybe once a day. If they see the bird lying like this, they may pick it up and, and wring its neck on the spot. But quite often they won't. People who've gone undercover into chicken sheds have often found the corpses of birds who have, whose legs have collapsed and they have simply died. They've died because they couldn't get to food or water. So essentially they've died of thirst, or possibly starvation if there was food there. It's a horrible, miserable, lingering death. And because the numbers of chickens are so huge, the number that ha this happens to is also very large. So here's another way of looking at uh, the amount of suffering that happens in the chicken industry. 
These are American figures, and they come from a website, uh, I thought I acknowledge it, you can't see it, they come from a website called Counting Animals, which uh, I recommend you look at, countinganimals.org. Um, so this big pie chart here is not the number of chickens who are killed each year in the United States. As I said, that's about nine billion. This is the number of chickens who die before they're killed. Die in the way that that bird I just showed you died. Or died from some other kind of stress. These are young birds dying from the conditions under which they're living and the genetics that they were bred to have. And in the United States each year, that's 139 million. And you can compare that if you think that, well, you know, there's a lot of suffering elsewhere. What about suffering in laboratories? What about suffering in the fur industry? What about uh, suffering of animals killed in shelters, dogs and cats in shelters? Well, that totals in the United States 25 million. So we're talking about almost six times as many chickens suffering to death as all of the animals in the fur industry, in the labs and in shelters. So that's why I think this really should be a priority to try to stop this amount of suffering, which could be done, for example, by getting producers to breed birds who grow more slowly. Or alternatively, if they're not willing to do that, of course, it could be done by telling people how much suffering they're responsible for when they eat chicken. You know, I often meet people who talk about what, you know, what I eat. They know that I'm uh, a vegetarian or vegan or whatever, and they, they get defensive a little bit and they say, oh, well, I, you know, I, I don't eat red meat. So, you know, essentially, they're, they're not eating beef or something like that. And I tell them, does that mean you're eating more chicken? And often they say yes. And I say, that's a lot worse. Go back to eating cows if you must eat meat. Of course, it's not the case that you must eat meat. But in terms of causing animal suffering, maybe not in terms of climate change, but in terms of causing animal suffering, you cause a lot less suffering if you ate cows than if you ate chickens. Okay. Um, so, but the problem is, and this is what I um, was talking about with the compromise you have to make, the problem is, as I said, that people care more about some animals. This is Wayne Pacelli, who until recently was the president of uh, the Humane Society of the United States um, and a book, The Humane Economy. Um, and he's talking about where people donate. So he says 90% of money going to animal protection is devoted to dogs and cats uh, and animals abused on farms or in laboratories receive a tenth of the available resources, though they represent more than 99% of the animals at risk. And similarly, here's another chart uh, that you can look at. So on the left, we have the numbers of animals killed or used. And you see it's uh, this teal color, which is overwhelmingly farm animals. Uh, then there's this little orange square of lab animals, the small green slice is shelters, and the clothing industry, furs, and so on, uh, uh, is the other slice there. So that's the numbers. And then you look at where the money goes. And here are the shelters, all of that. Uh, not quite sure what other is representing, but the farm animals are just this little bit here, and the lab animals are that bit there. So it's difficult. You know, we have to say we want people to, to vote, and I'm, I'm not necessarily criticizing the French uh, Parti Animaliste for putting a cat on their poster. They're just beginning, they need to attract people. But at some point, we do need to educate people that this animal movement is not specifically about dogs and cats. It's about all animals. Otherwise, we end up with a different kind of speciesism. Not speciesism that prefers humans to non-humans, but speciesism that prefers the animals that we love, that we live with, that we think are cute and cuddly, to the animals we eat. And I don't think we should be doing that. Uh, and then, of course, there's fish, uh, which is another issue, and maybe you know, again, maybe people may think that's going too far. Um, I did not really talk very much about fish in my talks uh, until the last couple of years. Um, but the numbers here are even larger, right? So um, <coughs> there's, a, there's a website called Fish Camp that you can look at too, um, which has an estimate starting at one trillion. That's the lowest number. So 1,000 billion. 
or a mini minion if you want to put it that way. Um, fish killed annually, and um, they say maybe it goes up to the high range, high end of their range is 2.7 trillion. It's a barely imaginable number. Uh, and it's true that many of these, the wild fish, actually are free until they die. That is true. But virtually nobody is doing any humane slaughter of fish. Um, I think I've, I've read that the Norwegians and the Dutch, I think, are doing some trials of electric stunning of fish from, uh, uh, basically from fish farms, from aquaculture. But the overwhelming majority of the fish killed are um, dying slowly. Uh, they may be hauled up in a net and dumped in the trawl of the, desk, uh, of the deck of a fish, of a fishing trawler, and they suffocate to death slowly. In the case of deep sea fish, uh, they die of decompression as they come to the surface, which must be an agonizing death as their organ, internal organs swell and explode. Um, so uh, I think maybe pe some people are ready now to start talking about this. Even though we have less rapport with fish, I think it's such a vast industry and it is also, of course, ecologically devastating for the oceans um, that it's time to start talking about it. And incidentally, I, we should perhaps particularly focus on fish farming. Um, you may think, oh, well, fish farming is not so bad for the oceans because the fish are bred and farmed. But the fish are, that are farmed particularly, uh, certainly in the West, are carnivorous fish. So they have to eat. And in fact, the trawlers go out and they catch lots of fish in order to grind them up, turn them into pellets, and feed them to the more valuable fish that uh, people want to eat, the salmon, for example. Um, so uh, as, with, as with feeding animals in factory farms, we waste a lot of the food value when we feed animals food that we could eat or that others could eat. And uh, in the case of, the, of aquaculture or fish farming, you have to feed two kilos of fish to the salmon, let's say, in order to get one kilo of salmon out at the end. So it's not better in that respect, it's actually worse. So what is the solution to all of this? Well, um, you know, certainly we ought to work politically to try to stop this, to make people more aware of it. But it is going to be very difficult. And another strategy that I would recommend, and I would recommend that a political party sort of support this, is the development of alternatives to meat. Because, uh, if we can provide people with alternatives to meat that do not cause suffering to animals, and if they feel that that really is a good alternative, if it gives them the same kind of tastes that they're habituated to, the same kind of texture that they want, uh, the same nutritional qualities that they at least believe they need, and is economically competitive, then I think it will be a lot easier to persuade them to vote against the kinds of animal practices that I've showed you. Uh, as long as people believe that uh, they are going to be worse off because they won't be able to enjoy the meals that they enjoy, then uh, it's going to be harder to persuade them to really think objectively about the suffering of animals and also about the environmental impact of animal husbandry. I haven't talked much about environmental impact, but of course it's already been mentioned. Uh, livestock production is a significant contributor to greenhouse gases. The uh, United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization says that livestock is responsible for more greenhouse gases than the entire transport sector, that all of the cars, buses, trucks, trains, ships, and airplanes flying around the world. So it's a very big sector and it's one that we could reduce rapidly if we could persuade people to stop eating meat. And that would be true whether it's plant-based products, which is uh, what you're seeing here actually, this, uh, these products, I don't know if you can read that, it's called the Beyond Burger, that's a, a product made in the United States. There's a plant-based burger-like product um, that is much closer to burger sort of taste and texture. Uh, than uh, earlier products, but it could also be what is now sometimes called clean meat or cultured meat, uh, that is meat grown at the cellular level, uh, in vitro, in a factory, 
uh, that was never part of a sentient being. Any of those would be both uh, eliminate the suffering that we inflict on animals and would at the same time uh, eliminate the vast majority of the greenhouse gases that come from the animal industry. So there's lots of things that we can do, that a party for animals can do, and uh, I hope that you'll support Dear Animal and uh, that you will help it to establish itself as a significant political uh, organisation in Belgium and that uh, in some future years we'll find that it has been able to follow the example of the Dutch Party for Animals despite, I know you have a 5% threshold, despite that difficulty, it should be possible to get more than that number of people uh, who are both disenchanted with the other parties and uh, regard concern for animals and concern for the environment, concern for altruism and compassion as something that they want to vote for. Thank you very much.